In this episode, I interview Eliza from Melbourne, Australia, and her past nine years in Dynamics to recently becoming an MVP. This is the Dynamics 365 show, focusing on the ingredients of a successful Dynamics 365 practice. Your host is business solution MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. I love engaging with the Microsoft business application community, so send me a message on Twitter or LinkedIn by searching for NZ365 guy. To review the show notes for this episode, please go to nz365guy.com forward slash 22. I'd like to thank the generous contribution from our sponsor, iNorgic. Maplytics by iNorgic is a market-leading certified for Microsoft Dynamics 365 geoanalytical mapping app. Maplytics empowers users with powerful map visualization and routing capabilities within Dynamics CRM to drive better sales, improve business processes, and engage right customers at the right time. Maplytics now works with Dynamics 365 version 9.0 and Dynamics 365 app for mobile and tablets. iNorgic is a leading Microsoft Gold Dynamics CRM ISV, delivering best-in-class Dynamics 365 solutions, as well as cost-effective and high-quality programming services. Hi everyone, I'm here with Eliza Benitez, and in this episode we're going to discuss her journey since 2009 starting with Dynamics in Wellington, New Zealand. She's a highly motivated and enthusiastic individual with nine years experience in sales, analysis, business analysis, and CRM consulting roles. She has great communication skills and enjoys the process of understanding and solving problems to support business process improvements. She adapts to project and support-based work. She thrives as an intermediary between business owners and the developers in the project, whilst helping a business owner with their support requirements. Overall, she is very much a people person and likes working in teams. To top this all off, she is currently the only female MVP in Australia or New Zealand that specializes in Dynamics 365. Eliza, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so I met you a few years ago and seen your career progress and you've been just recently awarded that MVP. What's it feel like? Yeah, it's, it's really great and I'm really thankful that I'm here today speaking to you as a MVP. I think this is my first podcast ever in terms of speaking as an MVP. So thank you for this opportunity. Excellent, excellent. It's good to have you here. I'd love it if you could kind of sum up your career over the past nine years. What's the journey you've been on to get to this place? I started in 2009 working for a partner in Wellington, New Zealand, and I got into I got into that company because they were offering a scholarship program for university students in their final year, and they were looking for someone that would be able to help out during their spare time and they wanted someone that would be a good fit for the culture. So I, I did a couple of interviews and through that I joined them and so I was doing my final year of university and at the end of it they had a graduate boot camp. But at that time, so that was back in 2008 when they were doing the interviews for the graduate boot camp, they were specifically looking for developers and I didn't have the technical mindset and they decided to keep me because they saw how I was able to interact with people and that I was always enthusiastic about coming in and you know working with with the team and so they decided to make a role and that was I think it was called a sales administrator or a sales analyst so I worked alongside the GM of sales for about two years and it was in that role that's where I was introduced to CM4. CM4 was was being used by the sales team and yeah I, I learned it. I learned it from a colleague who was in the delivery team. She showed me what CM4 was like and what I can do and so I I was able to build things like views and suggest fields that could be created to capture some additional information. And that's where I started learning CM4. And that's how my my journey started. Excellent. So so then, and then you progressed. So you're still in New Zealand. How did you get, you know, kind of getting, you know, fully into the dynamic space and then ultimately moving over to Australia? Yeah. So what, 
what happened was I was keen to move on from the sales team after two years, but they didn't have any roles going in the delivery team, but they did have a managed services team. And one year, managed services was going to receive a bespoke project that the company had finished developing. And that project needed some additional help in terms of troubleshooting the issues that were raised by the customer's end users, so the external end users. And through there, I helped out. And it was meant to be a, a two-week a two-week stint, but then it became a year. And then managed services were like, wow, you want Eliza, so I joined wow. that team. Awesome. Yeah. And then from there, that's when I started doing support for customers in New Zealand and in Australia. And so that's where the knowledge kicked in of being able to jump in and out of different environments and understanding things on the go of why something wasn't working and, and figuring it out and then emailing the customer back of this is the reason why something was failing and this is what you need to do to to get around it or we need to do an enhancement to, to fix this thing that's not working for you guys. So can you tell me a bit about the people that have influenced your career and and helped you along your way? Yeah, sure. So the, f- the first person that I want to call out is Sophie, Sophie Kuhn-Hammond back in Wellington, New Zealand. She was the one who taught me everything I knew about CM4 as well as how to scribe in workshops and, and do the documentation afterwards. So she was she was the foundation of my learning. And then when I moved over to manage services, the person who was guiding me, his name was Brent Wimmers. And listening to how he spoke with customers on the phone, you know, customers that he had never met in person, especially the ones that were over in Australia, it was it was really cool to see how he could just form that relationship instantly from just a phone call from the, hey, how's it going? Yeah, totally. The sideways reins is here in Wellington. What's it like over there in, in Perth? I bet it's I bet it's ridiculously human. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So tell me about now then. So tell me about where you live, work, play. What's life for you now, fasting forward in nine years? So I, I live in Melbourne now. So I've been here for five five years and I moved over because I wanted to know what the CR market was like in terms of clients and and the solution. So back in New Zealand at the time, the projects were CRM and SharePoint, but I wanted to know what it was like overseas. And I did try, I did try Canada and that's because I fell in love with Vancouver back in 2012 and I did apply for a company over there, but I never got a response. So I was like, oh. So then when I went over to Melbourne to celebrate my birthday, I happened to just contact one of the recruiters here. And he set me up uh, with three companies. And I interviewed all three and I got two offers. So I decided, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll do it. And when I moved to Melbourne and started working for the company that I had joined, they were doing ADX Studio portals. So that's how I got into learning portals, basically. And that really opened up my knowledge in terms of, wow, you can actually take CRM beyond the CRM and SharePoint space, which is which is what I, I had known previously. And that was where... I was like, wow, you can you can build a membership system using ADX Studio portals. So what I learned in my time there was how to do payment gateways and understanding, you know, things like when a refund is processed, how to handle it if it's a full refund amount or if it's a partial refund amount. And that was a bit tricky because CRM, well, it's not really it's not only really great for that. I think we all we all can agree with the invoicing in, in CRM. So the challenge of how do we how do we get that to work was was quite good. And yeah, it's been really good. Like the the solutions here in Australia are very different to to what I was exposed to back in in New Zealand. Yeah. And so, what do you do for play? 
for play? That's a good question. <laughs> I, don't, well, when, I feel like I, I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> when I did my research on you, I can see that you spend a lot of time in the gym by the looks. Oh, <laughs> are you referring to my Instagram account? Yeah, it might yeah. have been Instagram, yeah. Yeah. So I tend to go to the gym after work because I, I feel that's a good way of just zoning out after being in front of a computer or a laptop for, for eight hours a day. And I also like cooking. I love food. Everyone who knows me knows that I'm such a foodie. And so whenever they need to go somewhere, whether it's with family or a day, you know, they go, hey, E, where should I go? And so I, I tell them all the, the good spots, which is funny you ask because when Ulrich, no, who's also known as CM Chart Guy, when he came to Melbourne for Dynamics 365 Saturday, I actually made him his own Google Maps list so that he would know where to go if he wanted a coffee or, or a bagel or, you know, dumplings, you know. Excellent, excellent. So moving into the business side a bit, can you tell me about starting at the bottom and, if you like, how that kind of shaped you? So I started in sales and that's where I learned the, the beginning of the life cycle of, you know, being able to sell services out in order to get the work to come in for the delivery team. And I learned, you know, in those days that, oh, what's the expression, never mix delivery with with selling, oh, yeah. if, if that makes sense. So mm-hmm. <laughs> I, think, I think what that means is when you're selling, you're not necessarily thinking about the entire solution. You, you're thinking about how are we selling our services, selling that story, making sure that you interact with that with that customer and forming that relationship so that they, you know, are able to feel like they can trust you as, as being an advisor for this new system that they're about to implement. And the amount of work that goes behind RFP responses or RFQ responses, wow, I had no idea that that's, that's a whole nother a world of you've got like people reading the documentation, you've got like, you know, your technical consultants helping out with the solution architecture and then, you know, arguments going back and forth. No, it can't be done. Yes, it can be done. No, it can't be done for that price. And, and yeah, so that was, that was like my introduction to the world of, of selling solutions because the company they were they weren't just selling CRM they were selling things like like SharePoint and bespoke services as well as well as managed services in that role all I was doing was working alongside the GM in terms of making sure that the sales team had what they needed to do before they went out to sales meetings so things like if they needed information about about that particular potential client that they were going to I would just do the research and give them the rundown and then things like managing the sales forecast using the data from from CRM4 but yeah I was I was never really fully into seeing what the delivery team was doing because I, I was in the in the sales team so it was more of how the sales world worked. So how did you feel it shaped you because you got into the delivery side how did it shape you knowing if you like the sales side of the process to start with? Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, it's probably going to be salespeople listening. One thing that I did take away was what not to do, what to do when you're in front of of a customer. And I knew when a customer, just reading their facial expressions or the body language, that they're like, oh, come on, <laughs> stop talking and just, just tell me what I need to hear. Like, stop creasing up to me and stuff. Which does happen, but that's that's just the nature of it, right? Yeah. And I was able to to learn, you know, watching from the, the salespeople who were able to create and form that relationship quite early, you know, how they were doing it. And I really I really enjoyed that because it was just nice to compare, you know, what was good and, and what was bad. And I also found that in terms of well, most of the time when it was successful in terms of landing that client, it was usually when that salesperson had actually engaged with the wider team, you know, actually did the homework. And when it came to presentation time, you could tell that the dynamic between the salesperson and his colleagues was good because A, they had rehearsed it as well as they got along well 
together. Yeah. If you could advise a person considering a career in Microsoft Business Applications, what are the steps you'd recommend they take? Be open to learning and be open to listening to your peers that have the experience in designing a solution or understanding how to respond to tenders because you're going to be leaning on their knowledge, on what they know, and everything that you didn't know previously in terms of whether it was a, a different type of application. It can still be applied, but when you're doing the customizations and, and configuration, it's obviously a, a whole different ballpark from something else that you've configured previously. And one of the other methods that I think someone should take up and learn, whether it's right now if they're not a Dynamics 365 consultant or if they're, if they're working with a different application, I, I, I honestly believe that knowing how to do entity relationship diagrams is fundamental. I have seen developers as well as functional consultants that may come in midway in a project that struggle when they don't have a diagram because when you're going through a lot of a lot of user stories, sometimes it's words, sometimes the lead hasn't provided a flow or a diagram for that person to understand. But I always find that when you put an EOD in front of someone, yes, they may not know EODs to, you know, as in they don't understand EODs to the full detail, but they can easily see how the records or entities interact with each other. And one tip that I, I do provide to others in, in the team is if you are doing an EID, color code your rectangle so that you know gray means it's out of the box versus blue, which means custom, so that if someone else is looking at it, they can tell straight away what's custom versus what's out of the box. And I just think it's a, a good skill to have as well. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's definitely the way from, you know, day one, I remember going to a course in Sydney, flying over from New Zealand back then, and we built an app in a day. This was back in CRM4 time frame. And that whole process we did was around, you know, building ERDs and how you could rapidly phototype a solution if you basically visualized it out in that format to start with. So yeah, good call. Yeah. So part of becoming a Microsoft MVP is about sharing what you know with the community and basically community contributions. There's a saying that a rising tide floats all boats. So what does this contribution sharing to the community mean to you? For me, when, when I share something, so this is back in the early days, I didn't know if it was going to be useful to anyone. And I actually disabled the comments in my early posts because I was Is like, that right? Yeah, because I was afraid because I, I wasn't sure whether people were going to be like, oh, no, you're wrong. But it's, it's yeah, it's it's different now. But I suppose where I'm, where I'm going is if you know something, there's nothing wrong in sharing it and don't be afraid to do so because if what you know helps at least one person, then you've you've done something right you've been able to help that person understand something that they were either having problems with or they understood something little about it and then after reading your blog post or watching your your youtube video they're like oh wow i know how to do this now i'm gonna go try it out because it makes them want to try whatever you've explained or what you've shared in terms of how you resolve an an error message it will make them go oh yeah cool i know how to handle this next time and I think that's that's really good because in terms of sharing your knowledge with others it's helping them do good well as well because no one ever wants to pick up a solution that's been designed badly because of how that person didn't know how to do that outcome or how to achieve that that output yeah yeah. does that make sense yeah totally so what you're saying is that if you if you have Googled and you can't find something online and so you 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 finally work out how to do it, you're posted online, you're not sure if it's right or wrong, but you're getting it out there and giving other people the ability to learn from it as well. So it's kind of like your learning encourages other people's learning as well. Yeah, exactly. And then even even if it is incorrect in, in some way, 
you know, you may get a comment in someone saying, well, actually, there's a different approach that you can take and, you know, it'll take less time or it's more suitable to the framework of Dynamics 365. Because you do, you do see that happen, especially in the Dynamics 365 community forums. There's always people that are responding in there and there's always different approaches to, to everything. But there's always usually, I mean, I still do it myself. Like if I, if I having troubles working out how to do a particular process or I'm unsure about this particular function, then I'll Google it a bit. Oh, okay, cool. Someone's actually gone through this. I'm, I'm not the only one scratching my head. And it helps because, you know, usually people do something incorrect because they, they didn't know any better. And so when you're sharing information to that person and they know how to do it next time, it's great. Yeah. Have you ever been in the position that you've Googled looking for an answer to something you can find one of your own uh, posts or something like that? <laughs> yes. I would say that the one post that I, I tend to go back to every now and then is my uh, blog or my YouTube video on the product structure because when that was released, I think it was 20, same 2013, it was just different. Yeah. So that that's a whole product bundle and product family and the whole bi-directional and uni-directional suggested products, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it totally changed on that version because the functionality was built because, to my understanding, a back-end department at Microsoft wanted the functionality and the formal way the product catalog work wasn't compatible with what they wanted, so they invested in that change to the platform at that point. Oh, that's good to know. Mm. Okay, so what type of, just on this contribution area again, what have you found the methods that work well for you when it comes to sharing? Is it speaking at events like a user group or, you know, 365 Saturdays? Is it writing blog posts, video, audio? What, what works? I would say all of the both. Well, first talk about speaking in public. As a consultant, I think it's it's very handy to be comfortable speaking in public because You'll never know when you get called into a meeting or dialed into a meeting, I should say, and you've got people on the other side of the phone that you've you've never met, but you're called in because you're an expert in, in that piece of functionality or that particular vertical in that industry. And when you're able to talk about what you know at a comfortable level, it shows that, well, it shows others that, A, you know what you're talking about and you're not can I swear? That you're not full of crap. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll say crap. That you're not that you're not full of full of crap. But I don't I don't know how you cannot not talk to people as part of your job because that's that's what we have to do as as consultants, whether you like it or not. You you're talking to people every day, and if if you're afraid to be able to run a workshop, then you know, that's I'm not going to say slow you down, but that's going to cause you stress inside because you're so scared to talk to customers and it's not a good, a good place to be in. So I find that user groups are good. And, you know, I think Andre publicly said that you, in terms of your presence in, in Australia, in terms of forming the, the user groups and getting people to collaborate there it's kind of like a, a safe zone and I know that in Melbourne that you know none of us will will throw rocks at you <laughs> if you want to go and, and present you know people are there to listen and hear what you have to say and people will often you know chip in if they want to expand on whatever you you've talked about yeah yeah and then in terms of Dino 365 Saturday wow that's just a really good event you've got everyone who's passionate and willing to learn all in one day and hearing each other talk and it's and it's really amazing and again you're sharing your knowledge with others and the people who are there are, who are attending are wanting to know more about what you know so things like dynamics field services we had ben volmer presenting we had nadija do a session as well and it's a great way of being able to connect with others who are passionate about Dynamics 365 or, or Power Apps or Power BR because we had those other presentations as well. 
And so in terms of, of public speaking, I think it's it's very important in terms of progressing in, in your career because you have to be comfortable in it. That is the expectation that you're always going to have to talk to someone outside of your outside of the company that you work for, whether you like it or not, because that is what we do. Yeah, so good, so good. My actual rationale right back then originally came from in New Zealand, there used to be the .NET to user groups that used to run, and before I left New Zealand, I was involved in the leadership of that. And what we wanted to do is groom people up, if you like, to be able to speak at tech eds as they were back in the day. But Microsoft was never going to allow a tech ed speaker that wasn't a confident speaker, you know, to kind of represent one of their product lines. And so the whole idea of user groups and why when I went to Australia and formed the six user groups across Australia there was that a user group is a really great way to talk about a topic in a con, you know condensed amount of time where everybody's into the same topic as you are and then the progress of that as you get comfortable with that you should migrate up to like a 365 Saturday and then ultimately be able to take on much larger challenges of public speaking you know I've, I've come across so many people in my career that were highly intelligent brilliant but couldn't find their voice and and articulate in a way that other business people could you know if you like consume and understand and, and progress and so yeah I'd, I'd agree with you public speaking is a critical skill that you know complements whatever positional role you play in the uh, dynamics team yeah and i'd actually like to expand on that in terms of working with brilliant people who are very competent in the technical space but have a hard time relaying their thoughts to someone who is not technical, especially in in the customer world, and the customer has has trouble working with them. And I find that if I'm ever in that position where I'm in a meeting with them and I can see them having problems or I can, again, read the body language of the customer and, and, and see that they're not understanding what the person is saying because they're not in that mindset, you know, help them out, back them up. If, if you're the type of person that understands what that technical consultant is saying, back them up and help them. And again, it will show the client that, yes, wow, these guys do work together. You know, there's no friction between the two. They can finish each other's sentences, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, very good. One of the questions uh, that you mentioned to me was around understanding your experience around both negative and positive that you've come across in your career. Can you tell me a bit about perhaps those negative and positive experiences that you've come across and how you push through? Sure. With every company you join or no matter where where you work, whether it's the company you're working for through your employer or in the project that you're in where you are working with a customer, you're always going to clash with some people, whether it's your own internal team or from the customer team. So the trick is not to take it personal and it's simply to do with the project that that's going on because if you actually have a conversation with that person and it's not about the project it's fine so i think that's one thing to to understand in the first place but in terms of in terms of the personality clash that i mentioned it can be difficult and usually your peers will know they'll know and they'll make sure that that you're you're okay and personally clashes can also sometimes light a fire for that project it can be hard to to feel enthused and motivated and wanting to continue to work in that project and as a result sometimes people people do leave because they they can't put up with it anymore but for me in terms of how I've how I've handled it I've just soldiered on and you just got to um, learn to not not let it get to you. And I say that because if you walk away, it's not going to give you a sense of satisfaction because you, you, you'll know that, oh man, I walked away from that situation because I couldn't handle it anymore. And the people who do leave, yes, they do become happy in the next place that they join. But then again, if that type of situation comes up and, you know, if they'll, they'll reach out to you, oh no, you know, I'm having the same, the same episode or the saga all over again. And they're like, oh, what do I do? Do I, do I stay? Do I go? And if you haven't, if you haven't looked past the whole 
personality clashes and thinking about the bigger picture, which is do you really like the project that you're in or do you really like the company that you're in? Are you only having problems in that current time because of the personality personality clashes? Then understand that it's not it's not going to be long term. You know, we all rotate in and out of projects. We all rotate in and out of clients. But I have also found that people that you've originally clashed with in the beginning, sometimes, you know, five months or eight months down the track, you actually get along well with each other because the whole, the whole like working with each other's dynamic, it teases out. Like you, you find, oh, okay, this is what I can say or this is what I shouldn't do in terms of how I interact with it with this person because it's going to push the buttons. But if I, if I act in a different way and they're fine, then cool. Yeah. We're even. Oh, that's good. That's good. So feedback's important. It's uh, probably the way you take it on is, is, uh, is really important as well for growth, right? Yeah. And I think a, another negative that I have experienced as well, and I'll, I'll go back to the, the question that you asked me about earlier in terms of starting at the bottom is, when you are brand new to the CRM space like I was and if you do challenge someone who is seen to be senior and more competent than you are and they take it as, you know, well, why is this person challenging me? They don't even know anything. There's a right time and a right place to do it. And I say that because one of the things that, that I always remember is when CM 2011 came out and filtered lookups became available. And that was something that I had read in my own time through a blog. And when I found out that, you know, the lead at the time was still using JavaScript, you know, I had the guts to say, why are we doing this? Because it's now supported out of the box. And then the response response was quite negative because they were like, yeah, whatever, you don't know anything, I'm not going to listen to you. And... You know, it's a, it's a shame that that kind of stuff happens where your lead isn't being, well, isn't up to date with, with the new features and they're stuck in doing it the old way. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, the transition from CRM 2011 to really the, the platform taking on a whole new look feel after that point, I found, you know, in hiring consultants, there's so many people stuck in the 2011 headspace and hadn't upskilled or transition through to now what was available out of the box and it's one of the biggest reasons I'm a big proponent of continuous learning and and making sure you stay on the cutting edge when your customers engage you as meant to be their experts yeah. if you're not honing your craft if you're not up to speed with what is the latest thing you're really selling your customers short and really your your profession short if you're stuck in a hey this is how we used to do it four years ago when the 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 product has changed so much and you know the crazy thing is we're in that exact space again you know with cds coming out and where you know the various power teams power apps flow power bi etc play it is it's another period of a massive upskilling is needed to be done because just doing it the old way is not going to suffice me Moving forward, yeah, one hundred percent agree. Awesome. So, tell me about YouTube. You're a YouTuber. You've got your own channel. You're doing very well on that. I've just got into it myself and starting to to post a few videos out on NZ three six five guy, which is quite new to me. It's much more, I feel, kind of labor intensive. How have you found it? It is time consuming. I do my vlog recordings on the weekends, and after you do your vlog recordings, you have to edit it and then publish it and back in the day when I first when I first started doing it I was simply publishing posting it up on YouTube and then just doing a mini write back a mini write up through my blog post and then one of the feedback that I had received was your videos are, are great but for the people who don't have time to watch the full video you know perhaps you can explain what you've done in the video in the written format in your blog post, which is then what I which is then what I started to do. But then that which is great advice and that that adds up in terms of the time spent. But I I enjoy it. And so for anyone who does want to start doing vlogs, you know, you have to be prepared that you need to spend and put aside time to do so. Because if you are showcasing something that you've done as a proof of concept 
you know, there's hours that you have to spend in, in building that POC before you can do a, a rehearsal and then be comfortable. Yes. I can't do the video. And you do trip up when you do your recordings in terms of saying things that you didn't mean to or you swear, and that's natural, but that's the beauty of of editing. But it's also also a nice nice learning curve. Yeah. I think YouTube is a good channel in terms of being able to share your information because there are some people who actually are what you call visual learners. They learn from watching or seeing how you've done something versus reading and so that was that was my aim as well but I I also find that there's a lot of people out there who watch YouTube in general not not in the technical technical space you know things like how to you know cook tofu I don't know (laughs) that's the first thing that came to my head and I also wanted to bring dynamics into that that channel because it wasn't it wasn't well known back then you know there's only a few people in the dynamic space that were doing blogs and then the type of recordings that you would see on youtube related to dynamics was just a recorded webinar but it was never about how to or this is this is what you can do to achieve an approval process that was one of my early videos yeah, and that's a uh, Scott Darrow and his uh, YouTube channel is just doing fantastic work and, and what he's releasing and giving people updates is the changes that are happening with the technology, you know, from uh, he does some brilliant visuals, etc. to support what he does. It's, it's fantastic. I know his editing skills are supreme. I want that. <laughs> uh, he's a guru he's a guru i'm really impressed with him Scott, so if t- you're listening i can't wait to meet you <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's a great guy so you're talking to me about play it forward tell me what does that mean to you and what are your thoughts on it yeah so well i'm just going to do recap in the movie i think there's there's three there's three items to it so one is doing something big that will benefit the person and the second one is you know that person isn't able to do it themselves so you've you, you've changed You've changed how they, are, how they um, perceive that particular thing that you show them, and then the third one is making sure that they are able to do the same for for someone else, like going out of their way to help someone who who needs it. And I think again, that's important in our in our community because we're always we're always learning, and like you said, there's a shift that's going on right now in terms of power apps, CDS, Flow, you know, logic apps using Azure functions. And so people like Scott who are doing these videos to help, you know, fast track people's knowledge so that they know how to approach the next client or the next phase in a project in terms of incorporating the latest and greatest features because we don't want to get stuck doing the old way you know, we want to move forward and take advantage of all these products that are now available to Dynamics 365. You know, we're now living in the type of world in the, in the community where all these products now complement each other. It's no longer isolated. We're now, it's now, it's now becoming one, basically. Yeah, so true. Okay, so before we get into some quick fire questions... What is your goals aspirationally for the future around Microsoft Business Applications? Where do you see yourself in the next three years? In the next three years, I'd like to be running running boot camps for university students. That's something that I've always I've always wanted to do, and I and I say that because I I feel like that generation is our future of dynamics and or you know Office six six five parents, whatever you want to call it, and. I want to help them be prepared that when they do enter the world of corporate, they're bound to come across one of these products. And if they can get an early kickstart, that would be great. And I really like how there's companies now that are actually doing graduate programs. And as part of that graduate program, you know, they're taking them into a team where they are then made responsible to learn those applications and I just feel like if they if they get an early head start then it would just it would just be great. I don't know how that would happen because obviously there's licensing involved with all the different environments that you would have to spin up for them in terms of learning. But 
hey, it might happen. You can make it happen. We look forward to those boot camps that you'll be running in the future. <laughs> so to wrap up, I've got a couple of quickfire questions that I'm going to run through. And really, I'm just going to ask a question. And the first thing that pops to your mind, I just want you to call it out and we'll wrap the show. So what books, blogs, or podcasts do you recommend most to people and why? Well, for books, Sapiens. So that's the book that I'm, I'm currently reading. It's actually quite interesting to learn where we've come from as a species. Nice. Anything else? No, that's all I can think of. <laughs> awesome. That's cool. What's your favorite mobile apps and why? So the the first one that pops into mind is Instagram because it's it's so simple, just how people interact with it. You just either post a photo or a video and boom, it's just there and people just comment totally straight agree. away. Totally agree. I'm a, I'm a big Instagram fan. What's your favorite way to unwind after a stressful day? I like to come home play Spotify and have one of my candles burning. I have a massive collection of candles. Mm -hmm. Scented, I take it? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I I like the the sandalwood scents or or vanilla. I don't want the floral scents. Nice, nice. How do you stay productive? I read so or, or listen to podcasts. So as part of my morning commute, if I'm walking or on the tram, to a client side of the office, I just tune into a podcast or I just read one of the bloggers that I do follow. And then it's also talking to others, really, in terms of something that someone else has has found. So I think so one of the, one of the ones that I actually do like that happened recently was so there's a guy, I can't remember his name, but he showcased a a gif on his on his Twitter feed about how he created parrot for pizzas using SharePoint lists and I thought that was really cool (laughs) and so that got me excited because I was like now I want to read it (laughs) sweet who do you recommend as a guest for the show in future I really want to hear from a guy that I've that I've followed since day one and that's Gonzalo Ruz Ruz I don't know how to pronounce his name and that's because I really liked his blog posts and I, I just want to know what, what he's up to, how, how he's doing. Excellent. We'll see if we can get him on the show. Eliza, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And congratulations once again on becoming an MVP. Before you go, if people want to follow you online, where can they find you? So you can find me on Blogger and on YouTube and on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And any specific handles for that? So on Twitter, I'm Benitez here. On YouTube, it's my full name, Eliza Benitez. And on Blogger, it's Benitez here. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. This has been the Dynamics 365 show, focusing on the ingredients of a successful Dynamics 365 practice. Your host was business solution MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as NZ365 Guy. For more information on this episode, show notes, feedback, and resources mentioned, or if you know someone who will be a great guest for future episodes, please go to nz365guide.com forward slash 22. If you want to hear more great podcasts, please subscribe to NZ365Guy on your favorite podcast app.